So I was asked to uh, talk to you a little bit about the state of uh, Bitcoin uh, regulation. Um, so let me first tell you a little bit about Coin Center. Um, so Coin Center, as was just mentioned, is an uh, independent nonprofit uh, research and advocacy center based in Washington, D.C. Uh, and uh, um, we do three things. We do education, we do policy research, and we do uh, advocacy. Um, education piece is kind of one of the most important parts of what we do. Um, we engage uh, mostly policymakers, law enforcement, and the media to make sure that they uh, understand uh, the technology, understand how it operates. Uh, one of the biggest threats uh, to uh, the technology is regulation from a, a position of ignorance. So making sure folks understand the technology. So we systematically approach um, all of the policymakers who might have jurisdiction in this area uh, and help them understand the technology. As we do that, questions uh, emerge. Typically, we can answer them easily or put them in touch with folks who can. But sometimes you get questions where um, there is no answer because uh, the, the, the technology has outpaced the law. And so there is where our policy research uh, comes into play. We developed a policy thinking about how to answer these questions. What needs to change in the law to take um, these questions into account? And then finally, we do advocacy. Right? We, we develop policy thinking with clear recommendations that make sure that we can protect um, the ability to innovate. And uh, we advocate. We're a 501c4 lobbying organization. So we can go to Congress, go to different regulatory agencies, go to different uh, state capitals and lobby on behalf of uh, changes to law that will allow uh, uh, cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin uh, to, to thrive. Uh, we have a full-time staff of five individuals, three of us are uh, attorneys, um, and uh, we've, in the about year and a half that we've been operating, become the, the preeminent uh, group in D.C. Our goal is to, uh, if you think about Bitcoin, you think about Coin Center in D.C., and I think we've achieved that. We have broad support uh, from uh, individuals um, who care about this technology as well as the industry. We count uh, Andreessen Horowitz, New Square Ventures, Coinbase, BitPay, BitGo, Zappo, ItBit, Chain, um, and many others uh, among our uh, supporters. So let's start with this question, which I is sort of the first question we need to ask ourselves because we very often uh, hear that Bitcoin is not regulated, right? So is Bitcoin uh, regulated? We see this a lot. So for example, here is BBC News. Uh, this is just several quotes from media reports. The so far unregulated digital currency has courted controversy. All right, this is from BBC News. Here's USA Today. The value in a decentralized and unregulated digital currency has plummeted, et cetera, et cetera. Here's Time. A Texas man was charged with fraud in New York on Thursday in what federal authority claimed is the first ever Ponzi scheme involving the unregulated digital currency, Bitcoin. And this one is especially funny to me because if Bitcoin was unregulated, then what was this man charged with, right? So I think a lot of this confusion stems from what we mean by Bitcoin, right? Because if by Bitcoin you mean the technology, the protocol, the network, um, then you really cannot regulate it, right? It's impossible to regulate. Software code is typically protected speech, at least in the United States. Um, and also a peer-to-peer -peer network um, is almost impossible to regulate simply because it's too, there are too many users uh, to police efficiently. So you really can't regulate this technology. It's also actually maybe more accurate uh, to say that Bitcoin is never unregulated because Bitcoin is, at the end of the day, a protocol. And what is the definition of a protocol? Well, it's a set of rules, right? Bitcoin is an attempt to, it's an attempt at regulation through cryptographic means rather than human institutions. So, right, so it's maybe more fair to say that Bitcoin is never unregulated. Um, another reason that there's confusion is this notion that because governments have not acted Right, because they have not issued regulations or created law that covers Bitcoin um, or that mentions Bitcoin or cryptocurrencies directly, that therefore it is not regulated. And that's not the case, right? In fact, if, uh, if there's law and regulation that covers an, an activity, um, then it's going to cover that activity no matter what technology is being employed, whether it's centralized, whether it's decentralized, whether it's cryptocurrency or anything else. So. In that sense, Bitcoin has been regulated since its inception, um, meaning the businesses and the persons who use the technology for particular uses, those particular uses and those particular entities have always been regulated. Now, the government may issue clarification to their existing regulations to tell you 
that you indeed are or how uh, you will be regulated, um, but you will always uh, have been regulated. And this is the same um, everywhere. And the main areas of, of uh, Bitcoin um, regulation are these. It's anti-money laundering and terrorist financing. It's uh, uh, the enforcement of sanctions regimes. Uh, it's going to be consumer protection. And then this, yeah, those are the sort of main ones. And there's this broad category that I call other, which includes tax, securities, derivatives, uh, et cetera. Uh, and again, as I say, this is sort of the same, these are the same concerns everywhere across the globe. Some areas, uh, some countries are more friendly uh, than others. Typically, um, that you know, depends on capital controls. So the ones you see are more unfriendly. Um, typically, it's capital controls that you're concerned about. So you see in this um, map that Iceland and Venezuela uh, are the most unfriendly, and that's because of capital controls. Iceland, for example, is, um, uh, is loosening uh, those restrictions. China, Russia, a little uh, ambivalent. Where we don't have capital controls uh, in Europe and the US, it's going to be much friendlier. And uh, I have to say that um, in the UK, for example, um, there's been a very progressive uh, government there uh, you know, looking at how it can establish a leadership uh, position in the fintech space, in the cryptocurrency space, and has been very friendly. Um, and very friendly in making things clear and consistent and working uh, with uh, regulated entities in the space. That said, they're under the same constraints that regulators in the US are. They're facing the same issues of anti-money laundering and consumer protection. And at the end of the day, I don't think the regulations are going to look that different uh, from ours. Um, they just might just be uh, simpler uh, to comply with. Despite all that, I have to say that the US is still the leader uh, when it comes to regulation. And I think um, uh, that's because uh, it's uh, sort of been the first, right? If you look at, if you think about money laundering, consumer protection, uh, the U.S. has dealt with these issues first. Uh, if you think about uh, the FinCEN, uh, FinCEN is a financial crimes enforcement network at Treasury uh, that handles the Bank's, uh, Bank Secrecy Act. Uh, they issued the first ever guidance on how uh, a regulation applies to Bitcoin uh, in 2013. And the Bit license was the first real consumer protection law um, that affected uh, Bitcoin. So the U.S. has always been acting first. Countries tend to follow. Um, and in that sense, the U.S. is definitely leading the way. So let's talk through each of these areas. Uh, Anti-money laundering. So as I, as I said, in the U.S., we have something called the Bank Secrecy Act. And if you are a financial institution, um, you are subject to the Bank Secrecy Act, and that uh, poses certain obligations on you. And these are, number one, you have to register with FinCEN, which is a pretty straightforward process. Um, you have to... Uh, know your customers, which means you need to identify uh, who your customers are um, and have this information on file. Um, and you have to have an AML program in place and report any suspicious activities to uh, FinCEN. Now, this is pretty straightforward, but it, it requires a big investment um, uh, that otherwise wouldn't have uh, to be there. Um, and FinCEN, as I said, in 2013 issued uh, guidance explaining how their existing regulations uh, applying the Bank Secrecy Act um, apply to uh, digital currencies. This was a big area of sort of uncertainty, but I think we've sort of, um, uh, uh, sort of crossed that bridge. Is there's much more clarity. Um, the vast majority of companies in the space uh, are registered with FinCEN, are compliant, are reporting um, uh, suspicious transactions, etc. Where there is still a challenge is that. Um, there's an uneasy fit between the Bank Secrecy Act and its regulations and this new technology uh, because uh, this law and some of the regulations were written in a world where Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies didn't exist, where they, they were written for wire transfers. Um, and so one example is uh, the travel rule uh, of the Bank Secrecy Act, which requires a financial institution that transmits money to another financial institution on behalf of a customer, you know, to another customer, it requires them to send along uh, uh, identifying information um, about the customer, so the customer's name, etc. So think about it. If you have a Coinbase account and your friend has a Circle account and you want to send them money, Coinbase, as a, a financial institution that is uh, regulated under the BSA, 
is supposed to send your personal, you know, your identifying information to Circle when they send the money. How do you do that over the Bitcoin network? You really can't. Um, and so there, that's an area where the requirement of the law, which is written for a world of wire transfers and a closed loop bank system, does not, you know, ca cannot be complied with with this new technology. So that's where we still see that they're, uh, uh, we're trying to fit a square peg into a round hole. And that's where um, we try to work to get some further uh, guidance and further clarifications that allow you to comply with the regulation or change uh, the regulation. The next area I mentioned uh, was sanctions. Um, so sanctions basically is uh, where you know you have nations like Iran and North Korea, where certain uh, specially designated uh, individuals um, uh, who, through our sanctions regime, the U.S. says you cannot trade with these countries or, or these people, whether we like it or not. That's the law. Um, and you have the Office of Foreign Asset Control, OFAC, which uh, enforces these sanctions. And what is very interesting about this is that unlike the anti-money laundering regulations where you are given a set of things you have to do. You have to have an AML program. You uh, have to file suspicious security reports. As long as you do these things, um, you're in compliance, and as long as you're in compliance, you're fine. With sanctions regime, it's very different. There's strict liability. Essentially, uh, OFAC publishes a list, and it's pretty amazing. I've never seen nicer, um, uh, uh, sort of machine-readable form formatted data published by government than I have by OFAC. They essentially publish a list of individuals uh, and countries and companies that you, as a U.S. citizen and as a U.S. company, are not allowed to uh, uh, trade with or, or facilitate any financial transaction with. And your responsibility as an American, according to the law, is to look at that list and not trade with them. And if you do, there's no, whoops, I made a mistake, there's no, here's the reasons why, I was generally in compliance, I tried not to, it's strict liability and you can be fined uh, severely uh, by OFAC. Um, so again, there, the challenge is there's an uneasy fit between the law and the technology. So if I'm using, again, let's say I'm using uh, uh, Bitstamp or Coinbase or Circle, and I tell them I'd like to send $20,000 in, in Bitcoin to this address, do they know that this address is in Iran or North Korea? They have no idea. So it's, it's kind of impossible to comply with this law. And so, again, this is a challenge, and this is something that, at this moment, I, uh, OFAC is not really um, focused on Bitcoin, but I, I don't think it will be long um, before it become more focused. We need to be uh, ready uh, for that. And part of the story that we tell is that, actually, if you make the, the law too strict, what you will do is that you will, draw, you will basically drive out all legitimate users of the technology and seed the network to uh, 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 illegitimate users of the technology, something that they don't want. Um, that the technology actually, you know, if you make it simple enough to comply with or possible to comply with, um, gives law enforcement visibility into the network and allows them um, to do uh, their job. So this is, for example, this is a, uh, an exhibit from the complaint uh, against Karl Mark Force, who was a DEA agent, um, who was arrested for, for uh, stealing money from the Silk Road case. And part of, part of the investigation um, was able to show, uh, using blockchain analysis, just by looking at the blockchain, uh, funds that went from uh, Silk Road directly to Karl Mark Force's uh, pocket. Um, and so what we tell law enforcement and regulators is, if you make it impossible for companies to comply with the law, you're not going to have access to any of this. So you need to have um, a good balance there. Finally, um, it's consumer protection, um, which is a big one. Um, consumer protection, there's some at the federal uh, level. You have uh, Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. Uh, and you know, they're sort of investing, they're looking at this, they're interested at, at some point, I think we'll see them take some action. But really, the action that's happening now is at the state level. Um, and that's because you have state money transmission licensing. If you are a company that takes custody of consumer funds in order to transmit them somewhere else, like a, like a remittance company, or for any other purpose, if you're taking custody of consumer funds, and you're not a bank, 
banks are sort of licensed elsewhere. Um, then you need to get permission from the state. Um, you need to get a license. And sort of the origin of this uh, was like money orders. If you are, you can imagine in the 60s and 70s, this was very popular, uh, where money orders first emerged and you were, let's say, a low-income person who lives paycheck to paycheck. They don't have a banking account. They need to pay their utility bill, their electric bill. Um, what do they do? They don't have a checking account. Well, they cash their paycheck. They go and they buy a money order. They send that money order to the electric utility bill, uh, the electric utility company. The company gets that money order, and when you go to cash it, it bounces. There's no fund. Why? Because the company that sold uh, that person a money order went out of business, ran away. And so now this person is out of the money because the company uh, ran away, and they still have owe their utility bill. So what states did after a rash of these uh, sort of collapses, we've seen this before in the Bitcoin space, um, they created this system where they will uh, require a license from anybody who's going to take consumer funds for any purpose. And uh, uh, what, what getting a license entails is um, a criminal background check, posting a bond, um, uh, making sure you're compliant with federal uh, money laundering laws, et cetera. Um, Part of the problem with this is that money orders were sort of a local um, uh, business, and so it was regulated at the state level. And as a result, the legacy is that today, if you're a Bitcoin business that takes on consumer funds, you have to get a license in each of every state, each of 50 states. That's 50 licenses, 50 bonds you have to post. And the laws are all slightly different, and it's, um, it's incredibly burdensome uh, to comply with. Uh, New York, uh, with its bit license, was famously the first to create a new license specifically for digital currencies. There have been other states that have, for example, like te Texas, said our existing money transmission license uh, works just fine. Um, and so the, the challenge there is that there are novel concepts um, that these existing laws don't take into account. So things like multi-sig, right? If you have a multi-sig um, uh, address where you have two out of three keys and you have a company keep the third key as a security backup. Does that company have custody of your funds? I, I don't think so, but regulators don't understand that and the law as written doesn't take that into account. So what CoinCenter does is we've developed a framework for state digital currency regulation that takes all of these different issues into account and uh, creates a system where only if you have full custody of consumer funds do you need to be licensed. All other uses of the technology uh, are exempt. And so we are working uh, with states around the country, uh, California, Pennsylvania, uh, Illinois, et cetera, uh, to get that framework uh, adopted. Um, so I want to wrap up by sort of talking to you about the good, the bad, and the ugly of the inevitable regulation, right? All of what I've talked about, look, it's regulation that's going to happen whether we like it or not. Um, uh, I think a lot of us don't think we need consumer protection regulation. In fact, uh, Bitcoin provides consumer protections that the existing banking system does not uh, provide. Um, uh, Anti-money laundering uh, regulation in many ways is financial surveillance, right? Uh, the NSA, you know, we're very upset the NSA listens in to our phone calls, but yet most people seem to be comfortable with FinCEN listening in to our financial transactions from our banks. So we don't necessarily all like these regulations, but they're going to happen. And so the question is, do we want to be involved and at least get them to be as least bad uh, as possible? So what is the good, the bad, and the ugly of these inevitable regulations? So I think the good is that if you do not engage, what you will end up is with um, a, a huge patchwork of different laws uh, that are very unclear, difficult to comply with. You'll have less companies in the space, less adoption. Uh, so engaging and getting you know, regulations to uh, uh, come out more quickly and be better, uh, we will have this increased clarity for innovators and entrepreneurs that come into the market. You potentially have greater consumer protection, and more importantly, I think you might have the potential of a paradigm shift regulation, right? So for example, one of the reasons that you have money transmission licensing is that the states want to make sure that these companies are solvent, right? That if they take on a uh, million dollars of consumer funds, that they have a million dollars of consumer funds on, uh, on uh, in, in safekeeping. How do they do that? Well, on an annual basis, they audit you. Okay, well, with Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies, you can minute by minute check the solvency of the company. So
so this changes the regulatory paradigm. This is the sort of thing where we're trying to get regulators to understand that. So this is what's good. The bad is that ignorance of how the technology operates, not understanding that multi what multi-sig is. Multi-sig is, is completely foreign um, to regulators because it's, there's, there's never before been a way to have divided control over funds. Now we have this. Um, uh, so that ignorance of this can lead to unintended consequences, right? And one that concerns me the, the most is that regulators will misunderstand that while they may be able to regulate individual uses or individual users and companies of the technology, they can't really regulate uh, the platform, the network, the technology, but yet they might try to, and that uh, would be bad. Um, and also, again, these unprecedented capabilities like multi-sig. Uh, and then finally, that you have this patchwork of local laws uh, and national laws. So again, with, multi with the licensing regime, you have 50 different states, all doing 50 different things. It'd be much better to have one um, law that would be quick and easy to comply with. Um, I'm not holding my breath, but we're working uh, towards that goal. And the ugly, um, and I don't want to end on a, on a sad note, uh, but the ugly is um, there could be a black swan event. This is what I fear the most. Which is, you can imagine that there would be um, another Paris-style uh, attack uh, happen, and um, it had been financed. Uh, using Bitcoin, um, and that's a complete possibility. Um, and of course, if that were to happen, you and I would know that this is nothing about Bitcoin, right? Because technology is neutral. I'm sure this Paris attack that happened last year, uh, uh, email, cell phones, cars were used uh, for the attack. Yet we don't outlaw or overreact to, you know, email, cell phones, cars. Um, but with this technology, because it's so new, because it's so misunderstood, I fear there would be an overreaction. Um, and so uh, what we need to do is to engage with the people who could be, who might be overreacting in the future, we need to engage with them today. We can't wait for that day to be the day that we begin to make friends. We have to make friends now on Capitol Hill, at the states, at the agencies, and on law enforcement. So that they have somebody um, that they know is an honest broker. They know that folks in the Bitcoin space um, are serious. Um, uh, this is not a legitimate currency. And, uh, and that they have somebody they can reach out to. So that on that day, if hopefully it never comes, but if it does, we don't try to begin to build bridges that day. We've got strong bridges um, already there. And that's what Coin Center does.